Hey everybody, this is Dr. Kelly Donahoe, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about race and culture in the United States of America. So on my page, I have posted um, things about what's happening in the world with Black Lives Matter and how we're seeking equality for all people. And there's been some pushback on that, which I expected, and I feel that it is strongly my life's mission and also my responsibility as a white woman and a woman with a fair amount of privilege, including my education, to continuously bring these topics up and to discuss them. And I've been really thinking a lot about how to talk to people who um, tend to be white, um, people of color, black people. They know racism exists. They experienced it. Um, you know, most people who experience oppression know it and they feel it. But what I have seen and found is that it's white women, and generally it's it's been women, maybe because my page is mostly made up of followers that are women, which which is cool with me. Um, but I've seen a lot of white women sort of pushing back on that and saying things like, um, well, you know, if you don't really believe in it, if you, you know, it's sort of a victim mentality to say that there's racism or sexism. And I, and I wish that was true. And so what I'm here to do is just talk about some psychological concepts that are based in science. Um, they're not biased and the people that created them sought out to find answers to things. They did experimental work and I'm, I mean, I'm not going to debate the merit of science or why we engage in scientific inquiry. Um, but I do know as a psychologist that I didn't always feel this way. You know, I've talked about this a lot of other places. I've written essays over years about being, being white. Um, I, I was part of a really cool, um, group of people that got to write, um, um, in Pittsburgh for this magazine and and there's links on my website to some of these things, but about um, black history in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, I am not an expert, but I want you to know that I feel that it is my job with all these privileges to bring some of the things that I've had the opportunity to learn. And at many times that women of color, black women specifically, have taken their energy and their time to walk me through things that I just couldn't see because of my perception. So I want to back up for a second. Let's talk about perception. I, I really try to talk about this a lot. Human beings are really interesting. <laughs> this is one of the biggest faults that we have, but it also is what helps us function. So like everything, it's a positive and a negative, right? So the way that the human brain works is really cool. We only see what we pay attention to and what we understand. Our brain filters out everything else. Boom, gone. Um, if you're curious about this phenomena, you can look up um, inattentional blindness. Wow, it's mind-blowing. Basically, the gist of it is if you don't understand something, your brain will just not even show it to you. So the idea also that and, and, and this is called a lot of things, right? right? White fragility, etc. The idea that, that as a white person, I have done something to harm someone else, that guilt and shame, whether you feel that that's actually happened to you or not, can be so big that it can lead to people being unable to listen and to be open. So what I'm going to ask from you, which is what I ask from everyone, and I ask it of myself all of the time about everything, please be open for the next couple of minutes while I just tell you some information. Now, I, I, I came myself from a small rural Pennsylvania town, was 99.9% .9 white, 99.9% .9 Christian. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> People were all pretending they were hetero. I mean, it, that's just where I grew up. 
And so that is what I thought the world was. Um, I hadn't seen a lot of poverty. I guess people were mostly um, at the time, middle class was a real thing that then it's a lot different than now where our middle class is obviously shrinking and disappearing, but solidly middle class. And for years and years and years, that's all I saw. And that is what I thought the whole world was. And I would say things like, I'm colorblind, there's no difference. Well, of course, when everyone is kind of having the same phenotype and basic experience of being a white, middle class, Christian, hetero, et cetera, person, then it does seem like that. It wasn't until I was in graduate school um, and I took my first, in, in counseling psych, I took my first multicultural counseling class. And it's when therapists learn a lot about diversity and how to be appropriate and how to be anti-racist. Um, and so in that first class, I... I pushed back. I pushed back. I pushed back. I pushed back. I had examples of why I wasn't racist. And I had examples of things that I'd done in life that were um, anti-racist. But I could not accept the fact that due to my being white, I had had privilege. I couldn't get my mind around intersectionality. I, I am a feminist and I felt very strongly that, how is that so? I'm a woman, let me name all of these times and experiences that I've had of being oppressed individually, let alone on a systematic scale. It took a long time for me to listen and to be open and to understand that we can be many things at once. And the way that I've conceptualized this, um, and I had a TED talk about this, if you are interested in, in, in this idea, I, I think about it like arrows, okay? So there was this German guy named Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Bronfenbrenner. I love him. He, he, he took systems theory, which is this radical and amazing and mind-blowingly humongous concept, and he simplified it, okay? So let's start there. Let's start with symptoms. Sy symptoms. <laughs> let's start with systems, okay? So here we are. We're all part of this giant system of the universe. Actually, let's start the opposite way. We are ourselves. We are in the tiny, tiny self. Then we are part of a microcosm, our family. Then we are part of a larger system of our schools, our communities, our job, part of our city, our state. You know, if, if you want to break it down that way, um, governmentally, the country that you live in, the hemisphere that you live in, right? All of these things play together. And these systems are created by human beings, to organize and control. That is the history of how we've come up with systems for everybody, right? And whoever's in charge gets to sort of dictate how that works. Systems are real. Systems theory is part of nature. It's part, it, it, it's, it's part of the air that we breathe. And then all of the things that you're a part of your school, your work, relationships, everything, those systems trickle down into our very beings, right? We get married because that's part of the system. If that if that's not cellular, I don't know what is. We send our kids to school all day, and the way that that school is set up is a construct based on a system. So those systems are set up for the people that have been in charge throughout history, and those people are white men. For millennia now, Christian white men, generally speaking, mostly, especially in this part of the world, or at least with a Judeo-Christian understanding of how things work. Those beliefs and systems and things that benefit the people in power are part of the system. And when you're the person that gets to make up the decisions about how things work and which laws get passed and how money gets saved and all of those things, and you want to protect your own interests because that is how human beings are, well, who gets to benefit more? Well, the dominant culture. Pause. Let's stop for a second and discuss this. A lot of times people confabulate the idea of um, majority, minority, dominant, and oppressed culture it isn't necessarily the same thing. In fact, the the minority or the smaller group can be the dominant group. I, I actually doesn't matter to me. The numbers, well, no one that knows me would be surprised that the numbers don't matter to me. But what does matter is the dominant culture. Dominant culture gets to set the day. If you would like an example 
a very clear example of how what white privilege is, white, white male privilege in this case, and how that works. There are many, 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 so many, but here's one, and this one gets me every time, and as a woman, it gets me too. When medicine was becoming a thing, a field of study, peop, and, and this is true actually of almost every field of study, it was called it was called a convenient sample. And who, who was convenient to study? Well, people in college, because they were around all the academics who were beginning the studies. And those people were white, wealthy males. Okay. Much of what we know today of medicine, of psychology, um, and when I'm talking about that, I mean specifically diagnosis, how people experience and express and different mental health issues is based on studies that happened on white men. So what does that mean? Well, maybe you're sitting there thinking, who cares? That what? That's not nobody's fault. First of all, I don't care about fault. We got to just fix this now. So whatever, fault small. This is where we are today. And here's what happens. People of color and women, and then disproportionately women of color, get misdiagnosis. Their heart disease, this is a huge one, women's heart disease, gets misdiagnosed. Right now, this minute, black men are overdiagnosed with schizophrenia and women, all women, are disproportionately diagnosed with personality disorder, like borderline personality disorder, um, and also seen as what we wouldn't call hysterical these days, but we know through tons of data and research that women's symptoms are underplayed versus men. I could go on and on and on and on. Oh, there's so many examples and stories of how this plays out. The medical example is one that I hope you can clearly see just from time history and the way things have been, white men benefit from being the majority of culture, being the ones that were in the places where decisions were being made, where studies were being done, and being treated as the norm. White, male, Christian, wealthy was considered the norm. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but we're, we're pretty different from each other, right? So the idea that we would all need to be studied and normed for the measures that we use to decide if someone has a disorder or not, if someone has an illness or not, and then how they will express that illness, and then what treatment would be most appropriate, those pieces for the longest time, including still going on today, unfortunately, many, many clinicians don't check even when they use a norm, when they use a measure to see if it's appropriately normed on the person they are trying to give it to. This is just one example of what we mean when we talk about dominant culture and privilege. It's a privilege to be considered the norm. That's the most basic way to think about it. And that continues today. When you look at numbers of people on television and different ways that, you know, one group is represented versus another. And whether that forwards stereotypes, which, which are sometimes based in reality, but are often harmful, right? So not helpful. When we look at those numbers, we can see that we continue the process of keeping white norm, keeping male norm, etc. So we're breaking through those things and we're working through them. But I want you to see that when the systems, if you don't already, right? Many people do. But when you're part of a system and it benefits certain people over others, there's no amount of let me pretend that that's not happening that isn't actually going to impact your life. Um, if you don't know what redlining is, look it up. But the systems control wealth. They control where you live. They control where you go to school. It is very, very basic. And, and this one just gets me every single time. It controls your health, controls your health care, right? The kind of treatment that you get from everybody, from your therapist, from everyone, from your physician. It controls how long you live. These are facts. 
And we can say to ourselves when we are faced with really uncomfortable information, like this week, you know, with Breonna Taylor, the grand jury either wasn't given all of the information or it was misunderstood or it was misrepresented. Who knows? But when we look at these small, small situations, yeah, we can dissect it and tear it, tear it apart. But I'm telling you, the problem is the system. Moments will keep happening. Individual deaths will keep occurring. But it's the systematic problem that needs to be changed. And ignoring it and acting like, oh, that's not so, or that was a long time ago. No, it wasn't. We have tons of data. I have my own. And you know what? <laughs> I know this is getting long. I need you to take a second and look inside yourself. I spend my life trying to work through my bias, bias, my bias, my racism, my sexism, my heteronormativity, my, you know, my, my transphobia, all of the things about myself, my, my um, ability to do things with my physical body, you know, all of these things. I catch myself a lot with these old thoughts, ways of thinking that could impact and have impacted other people in my life, whether through microaggressions, small something that you could say, oh, it's not that big of a deal, all the way up to aggressions, you know, that I may not have even been aware of. And here's what it comes down to for me. And I, and I really feel deeply about this. When someone says they're hurting, how dare you say, but it's not real. At the end of the day, as human beings, there's nothing to argue about here. We have the history, we know. Let's talk specifically about the United States, although obviously this is a problem in the world. but. For the moment, let's talk about the history of the United States. In case you haven't, have you seen those charts that show the history of the United States, particularly related to, it has slavery, which was for a long time. And by the way, I grew up in the North and I always thought to myself, oh, the North, we're so much better because we didn't do slavery. Guess what? I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh and... Oh, I just realized I don't have my ring on today. Weird. I mean, I was doing yoga. I don't know. Anyway, I really, you know, you never know. No earrings. Okay. Back to the point. I grew up in Pennsylvania and I always thought to myself, imagining, you know, slavery and people being enslaved in the South. And I judged that as, as though I didn't benefit from it. And I literally didn't realize, and this sounds like, what, really, Libby? how much slavery helped the bring the raw materials to the north for those factories that I was so feeling so high and mighty about. This whole entire country, the, much of the infrastructure, and certainly where I live here in Charleston, which is where many human beings were brought to be sold in this country, so here we have this history, years and years and years, and it's all of us, right? You can't, please, if you got this idea in your head, like, oh yes, the North, yes, no, no, no. Um, so you have all this history, and then you go on, and then we've got Jim Crow, and we've got segregation, and this shit just ended. I mean, my parents were alive. It was like, 15 years before I was born, and I mean, I'm getting older, but I'm not that old. It's it's still here. These things don't just go away. And I feel passionately that I urge people who are white like me, and I don't care. And no, okay, I have to say this for a second. I also used to feel like I had to struggle financially I can't possibly be racist. I, I have experienced this oppression in many ways. I have a hip thing. Like I've got all, I have these things happening. This is what intersectionality is. 
if you're struggling financially, if you, if you're, if, you know, that's hard. That doesn't mean that this isn't also true. Period. I really was attached to my narrative that I had somehow pulled myself up from, in retrospect, I'm realizing a really nice life. But I still have this idea, let me pull myself up and that it was all just me and that none of it had to do with being white or the schools that I lived in or the neighborhood I was welcome in or never, ever feeling like the color of my skin was a thing. Never. There were other things, but not that. So when someone says to me, I'm worried, I'm in pain, I feel endangered, I don't feel heard, I'm going to listen. And if you can't listen to that because of a personal narrative or all the other things, right? Denial or disbelief about racial identity development or disbelief about systems theory or disbelief about the systems that we have created in this country and in the world based on specific ways of thinking and being that do not apply to everyone. I ask you to think of your own personal life. And I hope that if someone came to you and they said they were hurting, that you would say, let me listen. The system doesn't work the way that it is. And the only way it's going to work is if some of us move aside from our privilege. And that can be hard. I can tell you for myself, when I want to be quoted in an article, but it's asking for a black or indigenous, indigenous person of color, my first reaction was, oh, that's not fair. Or I'm a woman. Check yourself. That is what I say to myself. Check myself. That moment is where equality will happen. If you're denying that it's even a thing, well, I mean, come on, like, just no. We need to move to the place where we step aside and we raise up. We rise up. Where we rise up. And by rise up, I don't mean me rise up. I mean me. I have this really powerful vision of black women being in charge. And, you know, as a woman... There is nothing more powerful to me than that idea. It's not a white woman. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, 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 as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, am I going to cut this later? Maybe I'll cut this later. Maybe I shouldn't say this. You know what? I'm going to say this. A, the idea of a black woman in, black women in positions of power gives me a feeling that we will all rise up and the only way to make that happen is to step aside and to teach my children and as many human beings will listen to my long ass video that we have to be there for each other in a way that is way beyond words that is about a shift. It's about a stepping aside. It's about a holding up. I'm gonna so mess up. I probably said like eight things in this video that someone somewhere is like, oh my woman, what? And I stand corrected, I will be corrected. And I'm sorry that someone has to spend the time correcting me. I am open and I am ready to learn. And I am pissed as hell and I want to reach other people who also have privilege and I want us all 
to see it and to realize to me being a loving human means listening when someone says they're hurt hurting and then to figure out what I can actually do to help. I hope this reaches someone, just someone. And if you're mad, bring it. If I've totally like messed the whole thing up, bring it. But I've had this in me a long time and I really hope one person will listen and hear.